Good evening, everyone. So I'm sure you've all heard these prayers of the Eucharist, but we're going to go through them tonight and just look at some of them in a little closer detail. Like Father Ray mentioned at the beginning, I think it's important that we keep in mind, while we are certainly encouraged and um, enlivened by learning about the Mass, by spending time educating ourselves about what really happens here, we're dealing with the eternal. We're dealing with the infinite. We're dealing with mystery itself. And so we should strive to understand, but we are limited. And so that's where faith comes in. That's where we have to trust that what the Lord said is true. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. So after the readings, we move to the altar. And similar to dinner at home, we set and prepare the altar with the various cloths that are appropriate. We say grace. And we share food, which is Christ Himself. And through God's grace and the prayers of the priest and the assembly, your prayers are important here too. We believe that the bread and wine becomes Jesus Christ, who is really and truly present. At Mass, we call these three actions of the Eucharistic liturgy, first, preparation of the gifts, second, the Eucharistic prayer, and third, the communion rite. So we'll begin with the presentation of the gifts. This is the moment when the bread and the wine are brought to the altar. Though they are certainly two very simple foods, the priest will offer them to God so that Christ will make Himself present in the Eucharist. The simplicity of these foods reminds us of the child who offered Jesus his loaves and fish. Five loaves and two fish. It was everything he had. But when this little amount was placed into the hands of Jesus, it was changed into abundance and fed the entire crowd with leftovers. There was enough and more for everyone. In a similar way, our offerings of bread and wine placed into the hands of the Lord will also be changed into great abundance. We believe it will be changed into the body and blood of Christ to feed the great multitude, to feed us who are hungry and gather here to be fed by Christ Himself. In every Mass, we are this multitude Together with this bread and wine, we also present ourselves to God. We offer Him our efforts, our sacrifices, our joys and our sufferings. We offer Him our frailty. We offer Him everything that we are so that He may do great things with us. When God changes the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, he also converts us, making us more like Him. In the language of St. Paul, God transforms us into the body of Christ. And so our participation here is not only to receive Christ in the Eucharist, but also so that we might become the very same body of Christ as the church. So these prayers begin blessing the Lord for the gifts of bread and wine and asking God to change them into Christ's body and blood. And so for the bread, again, a prayer that you're familiar with. We say, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. To which the congregation responds 
Blessed be God forever. Then the priest comes over to the chalice. And taking the water and the wine, he mixes the two. Praying, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. So first of all, this recalls that Jesus used wine at the Last Supper. It also recalls the sacrifice on the cross. When Jesus was stabbed with the lance, blood and water flowed from his side. Finally, the wine represents Jesus' divinity and the water, our humanity. And now that they are mixed together, of course, they cannot be separated. We could try our best to remove the water from this wine, but it won't happen because the two are so intimately connected. And this is what we are invited into, to share in both God's divinity and to bless our humanity. And so he prays the prayer again, offering the wine. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. The priest then bows and says a prayer, asking that God might make him worthy to celebrate this sacrifice. Then he comes over and washes his hands, using the lavabo, as it's called, and the towel to dry them. And this is a Jewish meal custom, but it also reminds the priest and it reminds all of us that we are sinners in need of God's mercy. So the priest washes his hands so that he and all of us might be cleansed of our sins and so celebrate this Mass in a worthy manner. Okay, after all that happens, the priest then begins what is called the preface. And the preface simply means it happens before something else. So it is a prayer which prepares us to enter into the most sacred part of the Eucharistic liturgy, where we come before God. We are brought into God's presence, and we speak of how wonderful God has been to us. As these wonders are foretold throughout history, through now into the future, the assembly cannot hold back their joy. And so at the end of the preface, we all proclaim together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. After that is finished, the priest continues the prayer, giving praise and thanks and calling upon the Holy Spirit to change the gifts of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. He then recalls the events of the Last Supper, the high point of the liturgy of the Eucharist. And he speaks what are called the words of institution. And so again, I'm sure we have all heard this, but I'll I'll offer them today and just offer a brief reflection on them. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. He then elevates the host so that all of us can worship in reverence. Because at this point, it is no longer simply bread. We believe at this point, it is the body of Christ. And so he holds it for our veneration and genuflex in adoration, recognizing that this now is Christ himself. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this in memory of me. Again, the priest elevates the chalice as we believe that it has now become the blood of Christ. And genuflex and adoration once again. So following Jesus' command that he gave to his apostles that we just heard, do this in memory of me. The priest acting in the person of Jesus Christ says the words that Jesus spoke the day of the Last Supper. And when these words are spoken, what is on the altar is no longer bread and wine, but it is actually Jesus. And so in celebrating here together, we continue Jesus' command, do this in memory of me. Just as at the Last Supper, Jesus offered his very body and blood, so here we do the same thing. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and in memory of Christ, he is made present to us on the altar. It's important to say, though, that what we, when we celebrate the Eucharist, We aren't simply remembering a past and completed event, but we are participating in the actual event, the real event. So every time we go to Mass, we are participating in Jesus' one sacrifice for all humanity. We are made a part of that. It is made present to us, and we join in with Jesus in His cross. And this is possible Because Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. Which means that all time, past, present, future, is present to God. And He has chosen to be with us in a special way at the Mass. So the Eucharist continues to make present to all of us here His one sacrifice and the fruits of that sacrifice, which is our salvation. At the end of the Eucharistic prayer, after the priest has prayed other prayers, lifting high the body and blood of Christ once again, he prays, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And the congregation responds, Amen, affirming together that we believe this is now become the body and blood of Christ. Through the power of God, through the Holy Spirit, the church has been gathered into the body of Christ to share in the body of Christ. So before receiving communion, the church invites us to recite the prayer which Christ taught us, the Our Father. It is a prayer that prepares our hearts because it invites us into communion with God. After we've done that, the priest enters into the action of breaking the bread, which recalls the actions of Jesus Christ once again at the Last Supper, when he broke the bread before giving it to his disciples. The priest then holds up Christ one more time, and we profess again our belief in the power of the Eucharist and our need for Christ, using the words, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And with faith, we use the words that the centurion used when he spoke to Jesus, asking Jesus to heal his servant. And we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Of course, then the congregation comes forward to receive the body and blood of Christ. And when we receive the body of Christ, something different occurs. Not only does the Eucharist become part of us, but above all, we become what we eat. We become Christ-like. We become more like Jesus and our sharing in this Eucharist. So, I know that's quick, 
very brief, but that's the general outline of the Liturgy of the Eucharist, which if you stay for Mass, you'll hear all of the prayers included, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to catch some of the things that we talked about and have a greater appreciation and understanding for them. Now I believe we have some questions, uh, so Matthew's going to come forward for those we do, we do have some questions. We have two questions here, but I'm going to invite the ushers to go and take the baskets to come around and see what questions you guys wrote down. And we have two very important questions that we'd like our priests to answer. The first question is, what is more important than loving Jesus? I can answer that with one word. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, Christ is our, is our salvation. We, we need Jesus Christ, and so that has to be the, the first priority of a Christian. You know, those who, who want to live the life of discipleship well, Christ has to be the center. And, you know, there really is no other way around it. Loving Jesus is primary. And we believe by loving Jesus, we don't exhaust our stores of love. But that in loving Jesus first, we are given more to share. Through that love, we are able to love our spouses more, our children more, our friends more, our parents more. So it is really the, the first of relationships that we are to foster so that that love can be spread as Jesus has commanded us in, in the Gospels. Loving Jesus centers us on everything. It organizes everything properly. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question. Why did Jesus have to die for us? It is, it is a gift. It's the gift of salvation. It's the plan of God. It, it, again, it, it's the mystery that we fully don't understand this side of heaven. But we know that Jesus was born to live, to die, and to, to, to be raised from the dead so that we might go to heaven. That is the great plan that God has for us. And so we live here this side of heaven just for a short, brief time. And our true home is with God in heaven. It is a more complex response, but I mean, that, that's, that's a good question. Right. Yeah, his death freed us from sin. Um, can I get one of the baskets up here? Or does anybody have a question they want to ask right now? Any, any of the things that we learned about in Liturgy of the Eucharist, Words of Institution, or any of the videos so far? Anybody have a question they want to ask immediately? Yes. Hold on. Thank you, sir. Why, why does God care so much if humans worship him when there's a whole universe out there? Okay. Why does God care so much that humans worship him when there's a whole universe out there? Certainly, the, the scripture would say that uh, all of creation worships God. And worship of God, again, helps us rightly order ourselves towards our ultimate end. So our ultimate end is unity, hopefully, unity with God in heaven forever. And when we worship God, that helps change our hearts to create that ultimate goal, you know, to, to orient ourselves, to direct ourselves towards God. So worship of God is not for God's benefit but for ours, so that we are changed to uh, submit ourselves before God and, and humbly accept what He has called us to do. As, as His creation, it is simply right that we, that we worship God and acknowledge the many blessings that He has given us, which is life itself. Everything we have, everything that is in this universe is, is created by God, and so uh, certainly, you know, the, the creation altogether worships God in its own unique way. There's no way we're going to get through all these questions. You guys did a great job. Um, what does apostolic church mean? The four marks are that we are one holy Catholic apostolic church. So part of that is that the church developed over a period of time. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, I will be with you for all eternity. But he didn't give a handbook to the disciples and says, 
this is what you do now. This is how you understand it. So the church came to understand who she is throughout, throughout uh, time. And so in the first church council was held in the year, this is the trivia question. Does anyone know when the first church council was held? The year 67. Does anyone know when the last church council was held? I'll give you a hint. 1962? Oh, a lot of people said four. Well, it started with John, John 23rd. He died, and then Paul VI finished it. Right? So all of those councils, they tried to figure out where the church is. So the Council of Nicaea met in 325. That's when the, the religion became a state religion. And in that, they, they decided from everything that had been up to then that those were the four marks of the church. So, again, what we're doing tonight is we're just attempting to try to understand who we are as church. It takes a lifetime to understand who we are. Good question. How does it feel differently being in the congregation watching versus preaching the Eucharist as a priest and do your arms get tired while holding the chalice and the plate? I guess it depends on how long the great amen is. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little long. Uh, but uh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. How, how do we appreciate Eucharist differently as a priest? Um, you know, I think for me, it's just that I am privileged to be able to share in this ministry of Christ in a unique way. Certainly, all of the faithful participate in the pre in priesthood as we are baptized as priest, prophet, and king, but priests share in it in what is called the ministerial priesthood to minister. And so I think it's just uh, it's recognizing a whole new level of privilege and blessing. You know, recognizing that um, I'm very unworthy to be celebrating this Eucharist. I'm very unworthy to be elevating Christ in the Eucharist. And yet, God loves me, He loves us, and He has called me to this ministry. And so I think it's, it's just trying to appreciate that great blessing and trying to... Um, be respectful of this office that I have been given so that I, I celebrate the Eucharist with reverence. So I would say that that would be one way that, that I, I look at it. But that's a great question. Another perspective is if you all could see what we see, it would be incredible. So you all get, you have a perspective of the altar and the cross, and, but we get to see you. And it is a, a great gift. And like creatures of habit, right? We like to sit where we sit. So usually you sit in this side or you, or you sit over there. And so after a while, we get to figure out where you sit. And so when you don't come to Mass, we miss you. <laughs> it's like, I wonder where they are today. So it's, it's that community. It's that relationship. That, that's why we come, so that we can see each other and, and greet each other and, and to affirm each other, encourage each other, and even to challenge each other. So here's a question. It's, uh, is the blood offered since COVID and I haven't received since 2019? So we, we believe that Christ is present truly in both what we call species, in, in the bread and, and consecrated host, and then the wine, which is the precious blood. Bishop Hicks, who is our bishop, has said that we can start reinstituting the chalice with precious blood. So we're working and determining when the best time to do that is. So we want to be cautious and careful, knowing that COVID is still around. And we want to be mindful of people and their health and their well-being. And so it is 
being discerned, and as that comes, we will certainly communicate that with you. So I have a question here. How can I get more out of Mass? And I don't, I'll offer one perspective. I don't know if Father Ray would like to, but uh, I think uh, one way that we can certainly do this is through a rich prayer life outside of Mass. You know, spending time with the Scriptures for that Sunday, you know, so that we come already having heard them and, you know, maybe we bring our own reflections on it and then the priest, when he offers his, you know, it might change our minds or enrich our understanding of Scriptures more. Uh, I think spending time in silence is a great way to uh, appreciate when we enter into the liturgy of the Eucharist, um, you know, reverently sitting there uh, as the prayers are being prayed, you know, just listening, listening to what's actually being said and, and really preparing ourselves for what we receive. So I think um, a rich prayer life outside of the church that not only includes time spent in prayer, but also, you know, time spent in acts of love, in acts of service, in spreading the gospel as Christ has called us, in loving our brothers and sisters, all of that brings us back here and helps us to, I think, really appreciate what we celebrate because it is from here, from the altar, from our celebration together that we have the strength to go forward and do these great ministries and you know, sit in silence and spend time with the Lord and try to open our hearts listening to what God might be calling us to do. So I would say certainly a rich prayer life and um, you know, living the gospel through acts of service, even when that's difficult.